the teaching of um, Pastor Minnick, uh, who has been so faithful over all these years in um, teaching his people faithfully uh, from your word and training men uh, to go out all over the world to do that as well. And so, Father, we pray that you will bless this class and those who are involved. Um, thank you for uh, Dr. Arnold and, um, and uh, Dr. Oberlin and the work they put behind the scenes as well. And uh, we ask that you will just be with us uh, these next two hours. Was in Christ and we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I am. Um, I think. I think many of you have met Pastor Menick before or were in the class before. Um, I just saw Brother Jacob Lem come in also and uh, another, another person from Singapore. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Pastor Menick is my, my pastor and the pastor I grew up with. So I think we came to Mount Calvary when I was seven and um, mm. pretty much I was continuously there until tw uh, I think maybe probably till I was around 30. And then we started traveling to go to the Philippines. So that's a long time <laughs> to mm. be under one person's ministry and very, very influential then on just, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I am, I'm sure not aware of all the ways that it impacts my thinking and influences just the way I process things. Um, certainly that is the case when it comes to preaching among all the ways that has influenced my thinking to have a philosophy of preaching that is centered on the text and that is um, actually has a conscience about being controlled by the text, being controlled by what God's message is. So that's really why we desperately wanted to have Pastor Minnick be part of this class, if at all possible. His schedule is very busy. Um, even today, later on today, we've got some, we've got a, um, some family things going on and you can pray for their family right now, but I just had someone pass away within the family. And so that's going on later on today. Um, and he's still giving his morning here <laughs> to give us some time. And so I'm very much appreciative of all of that in, in adverse times and in just busy times. Um, looking forward to what he'll share with us. I'm also going to put up, or I'll just see, you'll see in the chat, you're going to see the handouts for this lecture. And so if you want to grab those, that's what we're going to work through. And um, you'll just see that come up as a link and you can grab that in just a moment. So uh, that's all I will say here because I don't want to use our time. I'll hand this over to Pastor Minnick. Brother Jeff, welcome as well, coming from Guam, I believe. And uh, glad to have you here. Later on, Pastor will be giving us some more interaction. And so I hope you'll be ready uh, we'll probably not just do the chat, but even if you turn on your, your microphones, uh, because we'll be doing some interaction back and forth. So please be ready for that as well, if you can. And um, I'll turn it, the time over to him now. Mm, thank you very much. So we all sat there? Okay. Somehow I lost my picture of myself, so I feel a little disoriented, but I, I guess normally when I teach, I'm not looking at a picture of myself, so... <laughs> Not any need to do it here. But all I have, uh, Joel, all I have up now is a screen that has your name on it. Is that the way it's supposed to be? Yeah. Well, but now I can't hear you. My apologies. No. Um, there's a, probably a button near that picture that if you hit it, um, it'll say like gallery view or there's a way to change the view so that you can see everyone's faces. Okay. Well, I, um, I can see three people, Jacob, Jeff, and you. Okay. What about Denny, Andrew, and Dennis, and I lost Ping? Ping is still on. The other, Pastor Halarsis, or uh, Denny. Oh, well, okay, the camera just okay, came on. Welcome, Denny. sir. Welcome, That's Paul. Good. good morning, Paul. How about um, Andrew and Dennis? Brother Dennis told me that his camera doesn't work. Um, but, and then Pastor Andrew, I'm not sure, maybe. The Dennis DeMata? Yes, sir. Okay. And Andrew. Okay. But where did Ping go, I wonder? Uh, I see him over here. You might, <laughs> you might have to scroll through or put it, if you, uh, if you're seeing those guys, maybe he's on there. Oh, there the we go. Okay. okay. All right. I see. I had to enlarge the menu or whatever it is there. Okay, good. So they've got the handout. 
Uh, just sent it. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, man. Good to see you today. I want to begin this morning with a passage of scripture that has been for about 40 years for me, just, I suppose, my primary guiding text on scripture. It's in the book of Ezra, and it's the seventh chapter. I'm sure that you yourself have meditated on this passage many times, but uh, this passage came to my attention just through my regular Bible reading when I had first entered the ministry. And, of course, the background to this is the people of God having gone back to Jerusalem and finished the temple. And the king of Persia, Artaxerxes, is desirous of sending back to them someone who can instruct them in their law. And the scripture says that it was Ezra who went. And I'm looking at the 10th verse, and it begins with the word for in our English versions, at least in the King James Version that I'm looking at here. And what, that, what that's obviously um, calling to our attention is that the reason that Ezra was the one who was sent back within the providence of God is because of what verse 10 says, because Ezra had prepared. If you're wondering how it is that among all of the scribes in Babylon that Ezra would have been the one, the answer is he prepared. And the text goes on to single out these particular matters of preparation. And one is that he had prepared to seek the law of the Lord. The second is to do it, and the third is to teach it. The word that is translated seek here is the Hebrew word darash. It was used for oxen threshing out grain. And you think of the old means of doing that, oxen pulling a heavy sledge studded with something that would help separate grain, the heads of grain from the stalks, threshing it out. It's interesting that that term also in the noun form came to be used of Jewish preachers in Jesus' day. They were called the darshan from this verb darash. And Ezra had prepared his heart to thresh out the law of the Lord, the entirety of the instruction of God. Because at the end of the verse, what he wanted to do was really teach it to the people. Um, my wife and my mother and I, my mother lives with us now, and the three of us have our family worship at night. And uh, we're reading through the book of Leviticus right now. We finished up last night a portion of chapter 14, which, as you know, are the laws concerning leprosy or skin diseases, and we're just reading right through it. There's not a great deal of application to a modern reader, obviously, but uh, one of the things that we just are impressed with night after night and reading through that is the detail of all of that law. My mother, who's 84, will just look up and, you know, she'll just exclaim, how did the priests ever keep up with all of that? Well, they did have to keep up with all of that. And the detail is amazing. In the passage that we looked at last night, it's talking about a leper who's been cleansed presenting himself to the priest. And the cleansing ritual includes things like this, that the priest will hold in his left hand, it'll stipulate in his left hand, some of the blood, and with his right forefinger, he will dip his hand in that and then apply it to the earlobe of the right ear and the right thumb and the right big toe. 
of the person who had been cleansed. You, you read that, and I, you know, I was mentioning to them last night, no priest dared to change any of those details. If you were a priest and you said to yourself, I don't, I don't think it matters very much which hand I hold the blood in. I mean, how could that be a big thing to God? What God cares about is the sincerity of your heart, not the hand that you're holding the blood in. I mean, you know, I'm a left-handed priest, and it works better for me to hold the blood in my right hand and apply it with my left hand. I don't think any priest dared to do that. Um, and this is the kind of thing, and, you know, this will come into play a little later this morning in our study together, but this is the kind of thing that Ezra had really given himself to have a detailed knowledge of. But what really strikes me, always struck me about this text, is, of course, when we're in preparation for the ministry, and even many of you men are in ministry, and you know that your, your regular routine runs from seeking you know, to understand these things, to teaching them. And it's real easy to omit what there is in between the seeking and the teaching in that verse. What is there between the seeking and the teaching? It isn't just seek it and teach it. It's seek it and what? It's do it. It's the living it. It's the incarnation of it in your own life that is so critical. And I think we can really assume that if Ezra had simply been a student of Scripture, no matter how capable, uh, he would not have been the one who had the good hand of God upon him. God was looking, obviously, for someone who was a living embodiment of what he was going to teach. So I want to keep that before us this morning, in, uh, particularly when we look at this first reading by Robert Dabney, uh, and it, you know, it's a little bit philosophically elevated, but uh, the important thing here for all of us is going to be to capture the living of what Dabney is talking about. Now, I want to give you a personal illustration to start with uh, here this morning. When I first went into the ministry, I was a seminary student, and I uh, my second year in seminary, there was a small church about a hundred and some miles from here that needed a pastor for a short time. And uh, my wife and I had just been married. And so they called us and we would drive up on Fridays, Friday afternoons, and have prayer meeting with them on Friday night. Saturday I would mornings I would try to prepare for Sunday and then uh, Saturday afternoons, I tried to get out and knock on doors. I really did that pretty faithfully the first year we were up there. And, set, of course, Saturday evenings back and preparing again. And then Sunday taught Sunday school and had the two services. So it was a really heavy load to do that. But I was young and enthusiastic and just thrilled with the opportunity. But at some point during that first year, it may have been early in the second year, I was just really frustrated with my preaching. Um, I, you know, I had been doing enough of it that I had a fair sample by which to judge the effectiveness of what was taking place. And I really was not at all happy with my preaching. And I, I didn't quite know what the problem was. I just knew that it wasn't at all personally satisfying. The people were very appreciative, so there wasn't, no one was giving any complaint, and in fact, we picked up a few families who started coming, hadn't been there before, and everyone was very happy. I, I, you know, I think I, in fact, I know I was really the only person who was unhappy. So, I had in my mind an ideal, and I realized that I wasn't even beginning to meet the ideal that I had in my mind. And my ideal was that of really teaching the Scripture. And I thought of a little motto. When I went to the text, I wanted to have in my mind this question, what is here that I can teach? 
And then second question, how can I best teach what is here? How can I teach what is here? How can I, or what is here that I can teach? And how can I best teach what is here? And I asked, you know, my wife, we're newlyweds, if she could calligraphy that on a little piece of paper for me, which she did. What is here that I can teach? How can I best teach what is here? And she framed it in a little frame. It's about the size of a, uh, just a small, about the size, you know, of a small, small card like that. That sits on my desk to this day down in my study at church. But I wasn't doing that. Somehow my sermon preparation wasn't going to the text and asking what is here that I can teach. What I, what I came to realize is that I had homiletics before hermeneutics, that what I was really doing was preparing speeches almost the old style of research where you go to your library, you read, you take notes on three by five cards. That's the old way of, of you know, some of the best thoughts that you find, quotations, anecdotes, so on. And then you kind of shuffle your cards around and arrange them and, and you got this sermon from, you know, you made a speech. It wasn't quite that I was doing it that way, but that's the way it felt. It felt like every week I'm making a speech and I wasn't really exegeting the text the way I was being taught to do in seminary and according to the ideal I had in my mind. So one week, and I, you know, and I'm just stumbling my way along. I, I really don't, it wasn't this, as I'm explaining it here to you, it wasn't this clear in my mind as to what the problem was. I wouldn't have said I'm just preparing a speech. It just we had that feel to it. I didn't like it. So one week, I went up to my study Saturday morning at the little church out along the highway where it sat, and I thought, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go to a text here, and I'm not going to use any books. It's just going to be me and my text. If I use any books, it's just going to be lexicons, concordances, nothing, nothing, but pretty much me in the text. That was a little scary because uh, I was accustomed at that point to being very dependent on a library. And when you have Sunday school and two services to preach the next day, <laughs> and you've been in seminary all week, and you're a young preacher and you don't have a backlog of sermons to just kind of throw yourself off the high dive like that, just me in the text, this is, you know, and you don't have a lot of time to experiment. So the text I chose was the boy in the temple um, in Luke chapter 2. And uh, I just took those verses and I just said, what is, what is here in this text that I can preach? And starts in verse 41, runs all the way down to verse 51. And I just sat there and started questioning the text and so on. Well, I ended up with a sermon. I preached it the next Sunday morning. And when my wife and I went home that night, driving home, I just said to her, that's what I want to do the rest of my life with the Bible. I want to do it just like that. I don't want to manufacture factor anything. I just want to lay out what's there. And I'm going to hope that, that that's what people want to hear. Now, I haven't always stuck to my ideal like I would like to, but that was a very, very formative experience for me. And from that point on, I, I, I really was on a new path. And I don't know whether I'm communicating very well the difference between these things, but it really is the difference between investigating the text and just coming on the Lord's Day and reporting on the text to your people or creating something that in the end has so much of your innovation and contrivance to it that 
that actually you get in between the text and the people. Instead of being a conduit for the text, it's like you're you're in between them and the text, and it's mainly you springboarding a little bit off of what there is there in the text. Now, during, during that time when I was going through that transition, there were a couple of things that I read. You know, I went hunting for somebody to help me with this. One of the things that I came across was a work um, in a series of lectures given by a man named W.G.T. Shedd. S-H-E-D-D. The book is entitled Homiletics and Pastoral Theology. That was very formative to me, and I ended up actually writing up a portion of what he said on a little piece of paper. I wrote it out, or I typed it out, and I signed my name and the date to it. said, this is what I want to do with the Bible. And I've still got that in one of the Bible boxes over here on, on my desk to this day. But another thing I came across was the writings of a man named Robert Dabney. And that's the first handout that you have today. And Dabney, I suppose, puts this in his most pure fashion. This would be what I would call a purist approach. I may be vary a little bit from what Dabney has here, but foundationally, this is as well stated as anything I'm aware of. When it comes to the philosophy of approach to the word, that really is my own approach and has been for 40 years now. And so I use this in seminary classes. Uh, Ping, I don't remember whether or not we use this in any of the classes that you were in when you were here or not. But uh, I would like to spend some time with this this morning. I've left some blanks on there. Some of the blanks are just to kind of keep everybody awake. <laughs> so you have to fill in the blanks as we go along. But, but, but most of them, I think, are because the particular words that I've left out are places that I want to get, I want to stop for just a moment. So it's going to take us a little while for me to talk us through this. But I hope that it's going to be, be helpful in the way that, that I was helped years ago. Now, if you look at that first page where I've got a picture of Dabney, I don't want to read all of this, but I do want to just give you acquaintance with him. In that first paragraph, you'll see there that he taught at a seminary here in the United States up in Richmond, Virginia, called Union Seminary. In his day, that was a very sound seminary. And he taught systematic theology there and homiletics for some 30 years. If you drop down to the third paragraph, I do want to read this uh, a portion of this here. Well, it doesn't come up quite as a third, it comes up in your second paragraph, I guess, there, where it says um, that he was a champion of truth. The second sentence, he had no patience whatsoever with any philosophy which contradicted, contradicted or questioned the scripture. For him, it was enough that the Bible spoke. He reverenced whatever it said as the word of the Almighty God and loathed what was called the saintly villainy of dressing up in a preacher's garb and then like a wolf in sheep's clothing standing in a pulpit to question its teachings. If you go down to the paragraph that begins with when toward the end of his life, uh, in the providence of God, he completely lost his sight. He was blind. But he continued to teach. And after 20 years of teaching, he published his lectures under the title Sacred Rhetoric. Now, that book, uh, I'm going to hold up here. I don't know whether any of you have this book. It's published by Banner Truth. It's a small book. Uh, it's not one that I'm recommending that you just run out and buy. But for me at the time, it was a very formative book and helpful. I've not, it's not a book that I've read every chapter in. But the handout that you have this morning is a condensation of some of the more important things in some of those chapters. And here's why. 
if you would go down in that same paragraph where the sentence begins with Dabney wrote in its preface. You see that? Sentence right underneath the title, Sacred Rhetoric. Dabney wrote in its preface that there were two things which he especially desired to emphasize. The first was the necessity of eminent Christian character as the whole foundation of a preacher's power. Well, that's what Ezra 7.10 says. Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. And Dabney's saying the doing is the first necessity. It's the big thing. He says, eloquence may dazzle and please, but it's holiness of life that convinces people. Okay. The second emphasis is the one we're dealing with this morning. The second emphasis had to do with this matter of the theory of preaching. He wrote that he wished to assert his view with all the force which and the words I could command ought to be in uh, uh, quotation marks here. He's saying that I, Dabney, could command. And now let's read what he said. In a sentence it was that expository preaching alone honors God's inspired word and limits the preacher Oh, I lost, <laughs> I lost my way here. Yes, and limits the preacher most strictly to its exclusive use as the sword of the Spirit. Take a look at that sentence again. Dabney's asserting that it's expository preaching only that honors God's Word and limits the preacher, keeps the preacher in bounds. Now, next paragraph are my words. I want to clarify that Dabney's explanation of expository, when he defines expository preaching, he leaves room for topical and textual preaching, but it's the kind of topical and textual preaching that actually unfolds what those texts say. And at the end of that paragraph, he also acknowledges the legitimacy of various styles of sermon construction. Next paragraph, but what Dabney taught against was preaching that reshaped texts in order to give the preacher a thinly veiled pretext for saying something that he had on his own mind, or the approach, unfortunately still popular, of preaching isolated words out of their contexts in using them for what he called mottos. Now, what he meant by that, here's an example he said he'd heard more than one Presbyterian minister of his day take these words from Moses, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. So the preacher would take those words, go forward, and speak of the duty of the church to make ecclesiastical or spiritual advancements. Go forward. The Bible says go forward. Dabney called this a species of sober punning. Is basically making a joke out of the text. And as a corrective, he insisted that the text must be accepted and discussed only in the very sense which it had in the mind of the Holy Spirit. And he said the preacher has no concern with and no right to any other approach to the Scripture. So that's a little sample there. What I'd like for you to do is go to the second page then, we're going to read through this, and I want to kind of talk our way through it along the way. And probably I'm going to ask for a little bit of interaction here from time to time as well. All right, this first paragraph, the Preacher's Commission, is basically a condensation of a whole chapter in Dabney's book. But this, is, this gives the foundational theory of things. He says, the preacher's task may be correctly explained as that of forming the image of Christ on the souls of men. Now, let's just pause on that for a moment. Um, would, you, would you have defined your task that way? Think of your philosophy of what you're doing, your preaching. What, what is your objective? Well, Dabney, he's putting it 
in the words of the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians when he says, um, oh, I am, I'm fumbling here because I didn't think to look this verse up beforehand, and I, I should have. It's chapter 1, verse 28, when he speaks of Christ and he says, we preach Christ warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. What would it be to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus? It would be this right here, to form the image of Christ on his soul. That's what Dabney's saying. That's a pretty good, isn't it? It would be hard to find any better scriptural statement of your objective as a preacher. Okay, so what's going to do that? Here's Dabney's view of it. He says there's a plastic substance, meaning there's a substance that a human being has that can be molded. What is it? He says it's the human heart. Okay, not just, he's starting with the heart. It's going to affect the whole body externally. But the thing that has got to be, first of all, shaped is the heart. Now, he says there's a dye for doing that. The word dye, of course, is an English word that has reference to a kind of a, a mold or a stamp that you would put on something. He says the dye which is provided for the workman is the revealed word, the scripture. Now think of that, you've got what he's calling a substance here that can be molded and shaped, and then what you actually already have is an ideal image, like something that you would put into a mold, and, and let's say the mold is the mold of a famous person's face, like a Martin Luther, this is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, so everybody's talking about Luther, okay. Here's a, here's a mold, and it's got, uh, you know what, can you all hold, and I'll, I'll walk right across the room and get something I'll show you. <laughs> One nice thing about having your classroom and your study is I can get up and get whatever I need. Okay, take a look at this. Okay, that is a little molded image of the reformer John Knox. That was made in a mold or a dye. This is just plaster or something. And you know, it was just a lump of plaster. But there was a mold or a dye that it was poured into, and, and out came that shape. Okay. Now, Dabney's saying the human heart is the substance, and then the dye is the word. Now, what's going to have to happen is this. He says the impression to be formed is the divine image of knowledge and true holiness to God who made the soul and therefore knows it. God, oh, I'm sorry. God, who made the soul and therefore knows it, made the die, and he obviously knows best how to shape it in order to produce the imprint he desired. So Dabney goes on and says, the workman's business is not to criticize that, that mold or to recarve it or erase anything in it which was committed to him. You know, I'm thinking that as my family is reading through Leviticus and we're reading the, the, you know, the leprosy laws. And, you know, in doing that, the last few nights, we've just had to say to ourselves, this is part of God's word and we're not going to leave it out. I mean, if I had you know, three- or four-year-old children in my family worship. It isn't necessarily that I would be reading through that, certainly not a great deal of it from night to night. But the point is that Dabney's making, who are we to, 
say to ourselves, let's cut that part out of the mold. He says our job is simply to press it down faithfully on the substance to be impressed. And the last sentence, in this view, how plain is it that preaching should be simply representative of Bible truths? Now, this next little phrase is very important in my mind, and in Bible proportions. If I can keep using my little current illustration here, the leprosy laws are not a big part of the Bible. Okay, so there's a proportionate here. But Dabney would say, you're not going to leave out any part of the mold. All right? In other words, that little, you know, I'm back to this little thing. There are little features on there. Okay. And the little features, they are little. But the fact that God is the one who made them means you don't leave any of them out. They are little. They're not as important as the big features, you know, the size of the nose, for instance. But let's, let's be sure we get that part of the, the beard on there because that's the way God made it, okay? So he says, the preacher's business is to take what is given to him in the Scriptures as it is given to him and to endeavor to imprint it on the souls of men and everything else is God's work. The dye, he says, is just such. It's a certain size. It's so sharp or so hard and has just such an image and superscription on it as God would give. So he judged in giving it to us. This was God's, God was the one who did it. And with this, now here's this great statement, 2 Timothy 3.17, the man of God is perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In other words, if you preach it the way it is, it'll perfect and, and what comes out will be right. And Dabney says, this is enough for us. Okay. Now, I think we all grasp that, right? Can you all nod your heads? <laughs> okay, everybody's nodding but one person. Everybody got, everybody get the theory? <laughs> okay, I'm looking at my pictures here. Okay, good. All right, but now let's look at the next paragraph. But there are many who shrink with fear. Okay, a lot of people, they, they can get, they understand the, the concept, but it's like, whoa, 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 that's a little scary. How come? Well, they think it's necessary to take a more ample range in preaching than simply showing the people what the Bible means and imprinting that meaning on their souls. Their secret feeling is <clears throat> this wouldn't allow enough variety and get this men, and it wouldn't interest people. <laughs> okay, interest is the word that goes in that blank. It wouldn't be interesting enough. There would not be verge enough or room enough for the preacher to display his own powers. Okay, so men, what do you think of that? What, what do you think of the response to that that says, well, I, you know, I don't know about that. There, um, I'm, I'm not sure people would, would come back for that for, you know, from week to week. I think they probably would get a little tired of that. What do you think of that? How does that strike you? Well, here's what Dabney says, next paragraph. What is this but the very spirit of unbelief? Dabney says that's faithless, <laughs> okay? I mean, right out of the gate, you're showing yourself to be a guy lacking in faith. But it's even worse than that. That is the spirit of self-seeking, unbelief, and self-seeking. He says, the selection of such forms of truth is evidently not guided by the lowly, self-devoted servant of the church, but by an eye to self-display. He puts it this way, God has put in your hands the sword of the Spirit, 
and told you that with this you will conquer, and you distrust it. This kind of a preacher distrusts the sword. He's going to add something more to it. God tells him, the word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and so on. No, says the unbelieving servant, I can devise truths more piercing, okay? He, he's really going right to the heart of the problem here, isn't he, in preachers? Okay. Now, let's move on then to his talking about expository preaching. You, you've got the, you know, you definitely have the foundation for what he's getting at. He says, I would urge that the expository method be restored to that equal place which it held in the primitive, he means in the early church, and the Reformed churches. And that he says, I would argue this first because this is the only natural, the word natural goes in your blank, an efficient way to do that, which is the sole legitimate end of preaching, which is to convey the whole message of God to the people. Okay, what's he going to argue for? Think of, think of what he said the commission is. The commission is to take the word, take the word just like it stands, press it down over a period of time on human hearts in the proportions that you have there, and Dabney says, how are you going to do that? The only method that will really accomplish that is the expository method. Any other method is going to leave out parts of the die. Next paragraph. If you will recall the scriptural theory of preaching, which was stated at the beginning, that was in earlier chapters, you'll see that it gives us no other conception of the work than the expository. This unfolds to the hearers the counsel of God for their salvation. Now, to accomplish this, it's not enough to dwell with disproportioned fullness on some fragments. A continuous exhibition must be made. Okay, now, everything that comes next, I don't think you have it in your handout, but he has put in bold type the remainder of this sentence. So you might want to underline everything starting with the words at least. Here's what he's emphasizing in this. He says to do this, a continuous exposition must be made at least of those important books of the Scripture which present the system of redemption with reference to the remainder for illustration. All right, now I want to pause on that because he put that in bold type, but in addition to that, it really answers a question. If you think about the ideal that he's talking about, and that is not leaving anything out of the Bible, including the leprosy laws, and then you think about, okay, but how am I ever going to get how am I ever going to preach all that? There's 66 books. There's 1,189 chapters, over 30,000 verses. How am I ever going to imprint all that on their minds? Dabney's telling you, you at least need to give a continuous ex exhibition of those important books of the Scripture that present the system of redemption. What books would those be? Name one. In your mind, what would be one? Romans. Got it. That, that, that would come immediately to mind. You know, here we are, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and, and what was it that Luther was studying that really got that going? Well, he'd been lecturing on Psalms, okay, and then he got into Romans. And then the next thing was Galatians. I think we'd all put books like Roman, like let, let's take a gospel, like the Gospel of John, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians would be another book like this, wouldn't it? Okay, Hebrews. Okay, very good. And he's saying, if you don't get to, if you don't really get to preach through all the other books, use them as what? What was the word he used? Illustration. So 
you know, I may not preach a series of sermons on Leviticus 13 and 14 covering the over 100 verses of the leprosy laws, okay? But Dabney's saying, you know, Dabney's saying, that's not really what I'm talking about. I am talking about you're not leaving anything out, but you'll use it in the proportions you find it in the Word of God. And that if you'll focus on these key books and continuous exposition of them, then you can weave in the rest. Now, you go to the next paragraph. He says, let us recur to the, to the, simil, the, the just simile of the dye impressing its image and superscription on plastic substance. To produce a fair transcript, the artisan must press it down equably, equably and place the whole outline upon the wax. This is accomplished by the exposition in the course of the chief parts of the Bible that we're talking about. But he says, he's talking about his day now in the 19th century. He's talking about what people then did, and they do it today. Our fragmentary modern method of preaching without context is as though the servant to whom the die is committed should divide it into small pieces and then select his favorite letters and keep forcing them into the wax at high temperature and extravagant pressure. And what he's talking about are preachers, and they'll just take a text here, they'll take a line here, they'll take something here, this particular phrase out of the Psalms, and this particular expression that they found in the book of Deuteronomy, and this two lines out of the book of Romans. Then they get all heated up about it, and they wail away about it and punch away, and they're, you know, they're trying to press this one line down on the people with extravagant pressure, high emotional heat. Dabney's saying in his day, that's what went on. Well, a lot of that goes on today, too. And he's, what, what Dabney is saying is that that is part of what lies behind Christians being misshapen. They're not... They're not shaped proportionately and beautifully. You know, it's, it, it would be like a sculptor, and he's, he's carving something, and he's, he, just, he just really, really gouges real, real deep over here on this one part of the face of his image because he's really excited about this, and you end up with a misshapen face. And Dabney's saying... You can't do it that way. Now, go to the next paragraph. Somebody, somebody, he says, may ask. It would be natural for somebody to ask. Will not this unconnected series of theological lessons, he's talking about my unconnected series, I preach a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, won't that still form, in the end, a complete outline of scriptural doctrine? In other words, if I... Well, you know, I, I know that I don't really do exposition through books of the Bible. I don't really explain Romans verse by verse, but, you know, but I do preach a little Romans, and I preach a little bit out of Ezra, and I something out of Revelation next week. And, you know, over the course of the years, won't it all happen anyway? Dabney says, I answer nothing short of the regular expository method will give you an assurance of that. He says, here's the problem you've got. The same impulses which caused us to prefer that method are going to limit your range of subjects. Our caprice, he means just your, you know, your own fancies, our fondness for some topics, and let's face it, we all are fond of some topics rather than others, and our indolent, or you can use the word lazy, our lazy reluctance to grapple with those heads of doctrine of which we're less informed, and the exigencies, he means the emergencies, the urgencies of pastoral interruptions, they always ensure a partial range of instruction. In other words, what he's saying is, you know, let, let's not kid ourselves. If we just go with the fragmentary approach, in the end, there are going to be all kinds of reasons, and he gives some of them here, that that is not going to be complete. 
And he says, next paragraph, this remark suggests a second that's not less important. And I think this is what he's going to say in this next sentence, I find to be very, very critical. The connections of truths among themselves are as essential to the system as the separate propositions. No man understands the system. He's talking about the system of biblical theology until he comprehends these relationships. Okay. Um, man, let me, let me try to give you a simple illustration here. We, we have all, I know, used a very simple approach to personal evangelism. Probably all of us have used from time to time what's called the Romans Road. If you use the Romans Road with somebody, where do you start? What verse do you start with? Well, typically people start with Romans 3, 23. All of sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. Okay. And then maybe you go to Romans 6, 23. And then maybe you go to Romans 10, 9, and 10. All right. Now, is that legitimate? You got, you got 10 minutes on a bus with somebody to try to get the gospel to him. Is it legitimate to do that? Of course it's legitimate to do that. But Dabney's saying, if you really want to form up the image of Christ in a people in a church, that is not the way to deal with those truths in Romans. He's saying the connections in the end are as important as those particular emphatic texts there. In other words, Romans 1, 1 to 3.22 are very important in getting to 3.23. And between 3.23 and Romans 6.23 is very important to get the connections in between there if you really want to understand redemption and want your people to understand it. And I think we understand that principle as well, don't we? that it's preaching those truths with the connections as the Apostle Paul explains them that is so critical to really getting a hold of things. Now let's go to the next paragraph. And I do have my eye on the clock here, and I know that we get a break pretty soon. <laughs> so we'll, we will do that. He says, we have found no better description of the preacher's work than that given by Nehemiah of Ezra's work. And we started with Ezra this morning. Ezra read in the book of the law distinctly. He gave the sense, and he caused them to understand the reading. And Dabney takes from that a prime object of pastoral teaching is to teach the people how to read the Bible for themselves. Now, brothers, I think that that is one of the primary benefits that comes out of systematic exposition of the Word. And I've had people tell me that through the years by way of appreciation. Um, the last one that I can remember telling me that is a young woman in our church. She is She would be about She's my middle daughter's age, so she must be almost 30. And she's gone from our church now. She's out in the Lord's work. And she wrote me a beautiful card about a year ago. And the primary thing she thanked me for was teaching her how to read the Bible. Well, I never sat down with her and taught her how to read the Bible. I don't think we ever had a conversation about it. What she was talking about was that sitting under expositional preaching through the years is what taught her how to think her way through the Scripture for herself. I, you know, any, it isn't that I've just gotten all kinds of comments about that, but every once in a while somebody will say something just like that, and there's hardly anything that somebody could say that gives me more satisfaction Um than knowing that they know what to do with the Bible now themselves. That's what Dabney's talking about. 
Keep reading there. He says, a sealed book cannot be interesting. In other words, if our people don't know how to read the Bible, it's not going to be an interesting book for them. If it be read without the key of comprehension, it can't be instructive. So it's the preacher's business in his public discourses to give his people teaching by example in the art of interpreting the word. He should exhibit before them in actual use the methods by which the legitimate meaning is to be evolved. Fragmentary preaching, however brilliant, will never do this. Okay. Now, I think we can finish the next section here before we take our little break. I'm going to zip through it pretty quickly. But would you look at the heading here? There's some obstacles to this. What are they? He says two. Number one, fear. Fear on our part that it wouldn't interest people. And the next one is laziness, our own laziness. Because it, it's a lot of work, okay? You know, man, I, I think we all understand this. I'll just ask you, have, have you ever prepared a sermon riding a bicycle? Or have you ever prepared a sermon driving around in your car? I could ask Dr. Arnold, have you ever prepared a sermon going from church to church on deputation while you were driving your van? <laughs> He's just smiling. He's not <laughs> well, I have, okay? When I had that first little church and we were driving a hundred and some miles every Friday afternoon, there were many times that Linda drove the car I sat in the car on the right side, and I'm trying frantically to prepare a little sermon for Wednesday night, okay? <laughs> yeah, we, we've all done that kind of thing, and there are times when it's just, you know, absolutely necessary. But, men, that's different than being a lazy preacher who won't get into the study and anchor yourself to the seat of your chair and keep at it with diligence until you understand the text. Okay. We ought not be preparing our sermons, running all around town, just concocting something in our mind and doing that constantly from week to week to week. You have your emergency times when you do that, but what Dabney's saying is the big thing that'll stand in the way of this is just being lazy. And what I would maintain, men, is this, that if you will put in the time and work hard at this with the Lord's help, it will interest the people. It will interest the primary, you know, people who truly know the Lord. And Dabney addresses that in the next paragraph. Look at it. He says, all popular readers of the scriptures have a strong consciousness of their own blindness of mind. They feel that in many places they don't have the key of knowledge. So when someone comes along and proposes to open the meaning of the scriptures, he meets the most serious desire of their religious nature. In that first little church, I had two people who had a college degree. I had a very simple farmer and his wife. I had a diesel mechanic and his wife. Those people had never had a day of college. I had several widows. I had teenagers. And when I got down to really teaching the Bible, every person in that church except one woman loved what we did and grew under what we did. Finally, the one woman came to me in the back of the church and said she was leaving because when she came to church, it reminded her of going to school. So she left. But she was a woman who objected about nearly everything that we ever did in the church. Um, she had a lot of other problems as well, but everybody else felt like, wow, this is really what I want. I want to understand my Bible. And I get excited when somebody says, I'm just going to try to teach you what this Bible says. Look at the last sentence in that paragraph. People feel that this is precisely what they need. So you are going to meet the needs there on that. I'm looking at the clock, and I've got about three minutes until it's 9.05 here. So let's finish out these three paragraphs, and we'll take our five-minute break. 
Dabney says there's yet a higher reason which guarantees the power of good expository preaching. What is that? It presents divine truth in those aspects and relations in which it was placed by that God who knew what was in us. We in our self-sufficiency detach a cardinal truth from its context. We define our proposition and we discard the argument by which the Holy Spirit has seen fit to sustain it. And Dabney says at the end of that, the effects of that will always end up being disappointing. But, next paragraph, if you will humbly take the same gospel proposition in its context, let him make all his human learning ancillary to the simple work of ascertaining and explaining the argument that's already there, drink into the very meaning and temper of that discussion, do nothing but place it without change or addition in contact with the souls of your hearers. In other words, press it down in their soul, you will find with delight that now you've opened a way to their hearts. I like the way he puts this. God's sermons will tell upon them as men's sermons never do. And in the last paragraph, what you're going to have to have, you got a couple of blanks there, I'll give you what goes in them. You're going to have to have faith, and you're going to have to have humility. Faith and humility, if you're going to do that. Okay, well, it's 9.05. We probably ought to take a little break. Um, when we come back, what I think I'm going to do on this last section is just give you the words that go on the blanks without reading through it so we can plunge on. I wanted to take about an hour on each of these lectures, so we'll get that one filled in. Then we're going to pick up the next one there. Okay? So... Dr. Ronald, what do we do? Take five minutes here or 10 minutes? What do you do? Yes, sir. Um, I've got three minutes after the hour, so let's okay. just come back at eight minutes after the hour. Okay, very good. See you all in a bit. Thank you. Okay, are we ready? Everybody back? Nod head? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, let's just zip through this final section here on the text. Dabney has a whole chapter on the text, and this, again, is a condensation. But I want to just give you the words that go in the blanks. He says in the second line, the preacher has no concern with and no right to anything other than what we've been talking about. And he says it's remarked by Richard Cecil. Richard Cecil was a friend of John Newton in London. They often met together for fellowship. And Cecil said the meaning of the Scripture is the Scripture. And what Cecil was getting at was when you preach, if you really want to be able to say that you're preaching the Bible, then you need to preach the exact meaning of what is there, or you're not preaching the Bible. It's the meaning of the Scripture that is the scripture. Now, I think this last sentence of what Dabney has here is very interesting. He says, if you, if you don't do what we're talking about, you will cultivate irreverent feelings toward the Bible's authority. Irreverent feelings. Let me give you an illustration of that. About two months ago, I went to the website of a ministry that I had found out is pastored by a fellow that I used to run around with my senior year in high school. And this is a quite influential ministry within a mainline denomination. I've had no contact with this fellow for over 40 years. But he's, he's really risen in the ranks. He teaches in the denominational seminary, and he was pastoring the flagship church of this denomination, the one that is connected with its primary undergraduate school up in New York. So he started a series through the whole Bible. He entitled it something like um, God's Story and Your Story. 
So he's basically, you know, he's kind of preaching through the books of the Bible. And he came to Leviticus, and his message started out somewhere this way. How many of you, or how many of you is Leviticus your favorite book of the Bible? Well, of course, nobody raised their hand. He said, well, that's the way it is for most of us. We don't really, we don't really care for these laws. Now, there are, there are a few of you, and you're just sort of legalistic, and so, oh, Leviticus is just really your favorite book of the Bible. You love laws, and he's just going on and kind of making light of this. Well, he was doing exactly what Dabney's talking about, cultivating irreverent feelings toward the Word of God with his dismissive spirit of part of it. Dabney says the next paragraph, I would impress you with the solemn awe of taking liberties like that. Don't do that. He says that's forbidden fruit to you. You can't do that. Next paragraph, one may ask, am I not justified providing the meaning I give, although it's not actually placed in the text by the Holy Spirit, it's still a scriptural truth taught elsewhere in the Bible. In other words, I know I'm not preaching exactly what this text says, but what I am preaching is found somewhere else. Dabney says that's, that's really, that's problematic, and he explains why. So the last paragraph there, he says the exact mind of the Spirit in the text is what to ascertain and then preach on. And when he comes to his conclusion, he says, our job is simply a strict fidelity, faithfulness, throughout the discussion. And this is the thing, he says, that will impress itself on every man's own conscience when we do this. Okay, that gives you what goes in those blanks. And that way you can uh, meditate a little bit with that on your own. All right, now... Let me just open this up for a moment. Joel, can, would you have a way of doing this where we could maybe for about five minutes take any questions about this? Or why don't we try that? Or just, or there may not be any. If there aren't any, that's fine. But I just don't want to leave anybody behind. So anything anybody wants to discuss about this? or When you commented about um, the concern that people won't be interested and you've got to take the text and make it relevant, I just... If you're actually putting out volumes of, you know, sermons in volume, you're putting out multiple sermons, I feel like I don't have enough interesting things to say. And the only thing that is really going to, to provide, what do you say, ongoing material and content that is actually engaging and interesting is to go to the text because it's so much more interesting than me. <laughs> Joel, that's really right. That, and that's, that's the point that WGT Shed makes that so hit me in his work, he calls it originality. He says the thing that will keep giving originality, we would say freshness and so on, is expositing what's there because each of those texts has its own interest. Good point. Anybody else? No. Okay. Well, let me, let me kind of finish off with a question here. A number of years ago, I had written an article for Frontline Magazine about these things, and I received a letter from a very well-known older fundamentalist pastor. A lot of you may know his name if I mentioned him. And he, he expressed appreciation for what I had written. But he said, I have been preaching the word and so on. And he named how many years. I, I forget how many years it was, 40 years or 45 years. It was up in the 40s. And he said, I have never seen in the Bible itself what you're describing. 
he said, I don't find in the Bible that what you're, what you're describing as preaching, I don't find that that is what the apostles did. When I read their sermons, I don't see them doing that. So he wasn't, he wasn't just being objective, you know, he wasn't just objecting. I think he was seriously inquiring, why don't we have examples of this in the Bible if this is the way to handle Scripture? How would you respond to that? What's the answer to that? Have you ever, have you ever wondered about that? Well, let's start right here. If I want to read the preaching of the apostles, what book of the Bible do I find their preaching in? Find it in the book of Acts. Okay. Um, what is what what were the what was the what were the apostles' objective? in their preaching in the book of Acts. What were they what were they trying to do? When you read those sermons in Acts, what kind of sermons are they? Those are evangelistic sermons. Those sermons that you find in Acts almost without exception you've got an exception in Acts chapter 20 where Paul speaks with the Ephesian elders. And I'm, I'm just talking off the cuff here, but I think that's the only exception that I can think of right off the cuff. Apart from that, the sermons or the addresses that you have in, the, in Acts are, are given to lost people. Okay. However, what we do have are 21 letters written by the apostles. What are they doing in those letters? They're doing what Dabney's talking about. There is systematic explanation and argumentation and then application of everything connected with the transforming of our souls into the image of Christ. I have no doubt in my mind that if you had listened to the Apostle Paul in Ephesus, when he set up, you know, teaching there and preaching there over an extended period of time, or in Corinth, I have no doubt in my mind, but what his preaching and teaching, much of it would have sounded just like what he is writing in his epistles, that he would have been systematically unfolding doctrine to them. So really, the answer to that concern is, we don't have recorded in our Bible the preaching of the apostles to local churches in which they are unfolding what they wrote about in their letters. But if you want to really handle what they wrote about in their letters, you got to do it the way they wrote about it, which is extended argumentation and discussion. So I wrote him back about that. I never got a letter back from him, but I, you know, I hope that satisfied him. It, it certainly satisfies me. Okay, any question before we move on? Here's one question that came up. Um, okay. Someone was just asking, this is through a message, if someone is saying, okay, I'm an evangelist, and so um, because I don't have this kind of ongoing continual investment in a particular body of believers, then it's okay to go more in a topical direction. Any input that you'd give there? Yeah, yes, Dabney... We may have missed that, but in this, I, I explained that Dabney is not speaking against the use of topical or textual preaching. He basically would define the right kind of topical preaching as being exposition. It's just the use of multiple texts. And I think probably, j just to use a simple illustration here, if you'll take Peter's sermon at Pentecost, he's taking what, three, three passages from the Psalter, three Psalms? Or let's see, I'm sorry, three passages. Joel, he's taking a passage from Joel, Joel 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 110, I think it is, and he's expositing them, especially Psalm 16, okay? 
So it's a topical sermon proving that the Messiah was to be raised from the dead and exalted to be Lord, and that Jesus is that Messiah. And he's using multiple texts, but he's explaining those texts. That's the right kind of evangelistic preaching. And, of course, as you know, Peter was pretty successful with it that day. <laughs> wow. I think that uh, that definitely confirms that topical preaching is okay. <laughs> Done that way. Good. Any other questions? No? Nope. Nothing else I'm seeing here. Okay. All right, let's go to this lecture entitled Honing Your Sermon to a Razor's Edge. What, what is meant by having a sermon with a sharp edge? Okay. Well, the, uh, this is basically taken from the, you know, the scriptural uh, metaphor that the Bible is a two-edged sword. What gives the sword its edge, its cutting edge? Well, we know that from a strictly spiritual standpoint, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. But from a human standpoint, what can we do to be sure that we are wielding the sword with the sharpest possible edge? All right? That edge, men, if you go to my little introduction here, the primary variable between a sharp edge and a dull edge. The primary variable is the theme. Okay, the theme is the edge of the sword in any particular passage. That's the cutting edge, all right? And that theme is sharpened in two ways. We sharpen our themes hermeneutically. What's that mean? in the way we interpret Scripture. In other words, careful interpretation in a passage like Dabney was talking about is what will give a sharp edge. But we also sharpen the edge homiletically in our construction of the sermon. And to really put this very simply in two points that then we're going to illustrate in the remainder of the lecture, our task hermeneutically, is to discover the precise theme of the passage itself. Now, let's stop and think about that a moment. If the text has its own theme, precise theme, and the people can see it, that's what impacts them. Why? Well, there's an authority to that. They can see the Bible actually says that. That's what gives an edge to our sword when we preach. Homiletically, what keeps the edge on that is this. I'm going to have to read the sentence. You'll have to fill in the blank, and I'll have to enlarge on it. But it is, it's the way we state that theme that we state it in terms that prepare for the logical subordination. That's what goes in your blank there, logical subordination. We state it in terms that prepare for the logical subordination of every one of the main points. Now, that'll become clear as we go through in the lecture here. But what it's saying is this. The text has its own theme. When you discover it and when you state it to your people, that creates sharpness and precision. But you can state that theme in various ways and still be saying the same thing. But if we work at it, and state it in ways that prepare for the main points, then that theme will be even sharper. 
because as you go through the main points, every time you come to a main point, it'll be like the sword cut again, cut again, cut again, cut again. Because each main point is in logical subordination to that theme. That's the theory we're talking about. I think it'll become clear when we look at examples now. So let's go to point number one, honing your theme to a razor's edge hermeneutically. Now I've only got two points there, two main points. How do we put the razor's edge on our sermon theme even in our interpretation? Okay, number one. I would suggest that as much as possible, you expose the theme to the congregation within the text before you announce it to them in the sermon. Okay, let me read that again. Here, here are two possibilities. One possibility is what we often do. What do we often do? We get up and say, we read our text, and maybe we'll use an illustration or something, and then we tell the pre people what we're going to preach about. Here's another approach. The other approach is to read the text and start expositing the text and let what we're going to preach about emerge from the text so that the people see it before we state it. I guess that's a simple way of saying it. Instead of stating it and then showing it, you show it. So they come to see it, and they all arrive at the same conclusion. It's like you don't even need to state it because they all saw it, okay? What you're doing is you're exposing it hermeneutically to them on the front end. Now, we're going to try a couple of passages in Romans 12. If you, you've got your Bible, and if you turn to Romans chapter 12, let's just work through it a little bit, just the way you would in your own sermon, exposing the theme. Okay, you're all looking at Romans 12, 1 and 2. You got a scripture text there for you. All right, here are these verses, and let's say we've just read them to our people. This is in the introduction to your sermon. You've read the verses, and then, you, then, then what are you going to do? Are you going to say to the people, here's what these verses are talking about? Well, that's one approach, and we can do that. But what will probably give a better edge, a sharper edge, is if instead of doing that, we say something like this. What are these verses talking about? Well, let's find out. Look at verse 1. What is the primary thing in verse 1 that the apostle is urging us to do? Everybody look at it. I urge you, brethren. I urge you what? What's he urging us to do? And probably, once your people get used to you questioning them, somebody in your congregation will state it. They'll say it right out loud, or several of them will. They'll say, to present our bodies. You say, that's right. Paul is urging us to present our bodies a certain way to God, and he says at the end of the verse that when we do that, it's our what? Present your bodies. This is your, this is your service. This is your spiritual service of worship. So, folks, what's the primary point of verse 1? It's presenting your body for service. Everybody see that? I mean, just say that to your congregation. Everybody see that? You do it by the mercies of God. When you present your bodies, you're living in a holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, this is your spiritual service of worship. This is how to worship God. Just enlarge on that a little bit. Okay. The fact that you talked them through it rather than just stating it made them see it in their Bible. That helped, that helped teach them how to read their Bibles. You do this week after week after week, you're teaching people how to read their Bible. And now, it's pretty, if anybody followed you, it's real clear what that text is talking about, okay? Now, let's keep going with this. You say, uh, so why is Paul saying this here? 
Well, let's keep reading in verse 2. He, he adds to this, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that. Everybody see those words, so that? He's going to tell you why this is important. Why to do this? So that you may prove. And that word basically means to approve, to test something out so that you can actually uh, prove it to be the case. Demonstrate that it's the case. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You, folks, you can see, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this the way I would do it in a sermon. I, you know, I would be saying, folks, you can see that the purpose that Paul has in mind here for all these things he's talking about in verses 1 and 2 is so that we'll have the ability to determine God's will. Doesn't everybody want to know that for their life? If they have any heart at all for God, what does God want me to do? How does God want me to serve? How am I supposed to make my decisions? How am I supposed to determine, you know, whether I take a Sunday school class or uh, whether I serve on the deacon board or what I do in the local church or, well, how are you going to make those decisions so that you actually know the will of God? This is the way. Present your body. This is your service to the Lord. Stop being conformed to the world. Be transformed so you may put to the test and come to the right conclusion about what God's will is for your life. So the theme, therefore, and I'm just talking again off the cuff. I, you know, I would probably work with the wording of this. But the theme would be something like the presentation that enables you to determine God's will. You've been redeemed, chapters 1 through 11. Now Paul's moving into the big section of application, chapters 13 and following, or 12 and following. And, you know, and a lot, I mean, a lot of the applications that he gives are just very general principles. How am I going to know how those principles apply to my life? You are only going to be able to make those decisions and come to those conclusions this way. Present your body, stop being conformed to the world, let the scriptures renew your mind so you get transformed, then you're in a position to test out God's will for you when it comes to the application of all these principles we're going to have. I'm just talking through that, but you can see how that works. Let's take another illustration. Look at verses 3 through 5, okay? You have, in verse 3, a repeated action. What is it? What's the repeated activity or verb? You're looking for a verb. An activity is a verb. What's the repeated activity? Through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allowed to each a measure of faith. What's the primary activity that a Christ, he's talking about a Christian doing? Thinking. Okay? Just say to your people, everybody see that? Why don't you underline that? I'll say to the folks, if you're a Bible marker, why don't you underline that? How many times does he say think in that verse? How many does he say? Three times. Not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think. Have them underline it, okay? See, they've all seen it. My, my point is this. You made them see the edge of the sword in that verse. You didn't just tell them the edge. Well, if you just tell them, half of them don't even get it, okay? It's when you compel them to look and when you ask them questions and you tell them to underline it and they can see it in the verse, the edge just sticks right out of the verse, because you made them see it that way. Now, the primary command of that verse is to think how? To think so as to have sound judgment. In the King James, I think it says soberly. Okay? That's the primary command. Think soberly. 
So what I'm trying to do here, I'm trying to find the theme of this little section. And I think I found it. I think I found it. I think the primary point is think soberly. Think so as to have sound judgment. Think about what? Think about yourself, okay? You're wanting to prove the will of God for yourself. It starts with the necessary conditions of verses 1 and 2. So now he's going to go on and direct us about doing that. When you do this now, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Like, here's a guy in a local church. You know, he's 18 years old, and he says, well, uh, I'm trying to find God's will for my life. I think I'd like to be the next C.H. Spurgeon. <laughs> Wait a minute. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Think according to sound judgment. Think soberly now, all right? Now, look at verse 4. What's the connection of verse 4 with that idea? For just as we have many members in one body, think of your body with all of its members, and all the members don't have the same function. Okay, what's, what's he giving here? What do you call this in a sermon? This is a what? He calls our attention to our bodies. We have our hands and our feet and our eyes and our mouth and our nose. This is a what? This is an illustration. He's using an illustration. Keep going. Next verse. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. All right, now what's he doing with that? What do you call that? What do you call that in your sermon? He gave the principle, verse 3, think soberly about yourself. Illustration, verse 4, and what's this? Just like the illustration, so we are, that's application. He's saying, when you think about yourself, recognize you're all a body, and they're different, different members, all right? So, I'm going to keep running with this, run right into the next verses. Since we have gifts, this is the word charisma, spiritual gifts, that differ according to the grace given to us. And now the, now the translators have had to add this. Each one is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, verse 7, if service, if teaching, if exhortation, verse 8, you can see what's happening. He's naming various spiritual gifts. Now, men, look at that passage. This passage, starting right in verse 1, the whole passage is talking about how to come to a right conclusion about God's will for my life as a redeemed Christian. How do I do that? Meet the conditions of verses 1 and 2, and then start thinking the way verse 3 says, with this analogy in your mind, the human body and many members, all right? And with all those members, we're not all going to function the same way. And here are all these various gifts. Now think soberly about yourself and let the Lord bring you to a right conclusion. And if you look there on my illustration number two, the number four there, the theme, therefore, of those verses, verses 3 and 5, could be something like this. You might state it a little differently, but sober assessment of our place in Christian service. A sober assessment of my place in Christian service. Very, very clear there, I think. Okay, but... Men, what, what, what's the main, I keep saying men, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a lady here I can see. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Hi. But what's the point of what we're talking about here? We're trying to make our theme sharp in the sense that it really, it really cuts through all the fog in people's minds and gets into their mind. And what I'm, what I'm suggesting is one of the ways to do that is hermeneutically at the very time you preach. And the way you do that is instead of just saying what you're going to preach about, 
you make them see it in the text. Make them see, you expose it in the text. Basically, now you don't always do that necessarily, but what I'm talking about here is an approach to that. Okay, now the second thing, look at the B there underneath that. The second thing that's helpful on that, hi Caroline. <laughs> Good to see you. Attempt insofar as possible to state that sermon theme in the text's wording, in the wording of the text. Now notice I'm saying insofar as possible. And the reason I'm putting it that way is because of what we're going to be looking at next homiletically. But my point is this. You know, I, I think one of the mistakes that we often make is in trying to always state things in some provocative, kind of neat, attention-grabbing way, okay? I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I find this in a lot of modern books. I will look at the chapter headings and then I will look at the main subheadings in the chapters, and I can't tell from the headings what the chapter's about. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, it'll say something like 50 helicopters from heaven. <laughs> like what? I mean, I, you know, I, I understand the point of using a title as a little bit of an advertisement, occasionally doing that. But, but this is just the, the rage today and every title and every point is stated in some oblique, nifty, crafty fashion, and you, to you don't get the point. I'd like to suggest if you really want your sermons to have a sharp edge, show the people the theme in the text, and insofar as possible, use the wording or at least the meaning of the words in the text as you state your theme. So if you look at what I've got here, you know, I said, go back to illustration number one, I suggested a theme like this for verses one and two, the presentation that enables us to determine God's will. Well, where did I get my word present? from present your body. Where did I get enables us to determine God's will? From prove what the will of God is. All right? Or take my illustration number two, the fourth point there, the theme, therefore. Sober assessment. Where did I get that? From what word in verse three? The word think. Now, I could have used think, but what I'm trying to do here, and you do this too, I'm, I'm trying to turn the color on the word think. And I'm also adding to it when it says, you know, the, the King James said, think soberly. So instead of just using the, ge the generic word think, I'm using the word assess, which is a specific kind of thinking that fits this passage. In other words, that's sharpening the edge of think. That's honing the word think to a really sharp edge. Certain kind of thinking here. Assessing. Sober assessment. Of what? Well, he said here, he, you know, he really didn't say in terms of a statement. He said, um, he said, you need to think as God has allotted each of you a measure of faith, then he used his illustration, verse 4. Then he said, verse 5, the application. Then he referred to all these spiritual gifts. So at this point, what you have to, you know, you had to capture something that's not stated explicitly, which is what? Your place in Christian service. So my sober assessment pretty much captures wording in the text. Next part of my theme our place in Christian service is not stated explicitly in the text, but that's the point of what you've got there. 
sober assessment of our place in Christian service. And being able to expose that, I think, helps. All right, now let's go to the next point here. Once you, once you do a little bit of that in your study and you get it stated in a way that you can really expose it to the people, <clears throat> then you want to go to work on this homiletically. And go back up to my introduction to the B and point two. Here's what we're trying to do. We want to state that theme in terms that prepare for the logical subordination of every main point. And I realize that, you know, that's, that's just almost gobbledygook terminology for a moment here. But it'll get real clear, I think, if we'll go down and go through a little exercise. Let's go back down to point two. What I'm going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to go through a little series of examples. And would you do this? We're going to look at some main points, and we're going to try to determine how razor sharp they are. Razor sharp in what terms? Look at what I'm saying here on this where it says a test. Razor sharp in their homiletical subordination to the theme. And we're going to rate them. Would you call them razor sharp? That'll be a number one. Or dull, that'd be, or excuse me, or sharp, that'd be a number two. Three, dull, or number four, I can't even see that's the same knife. Okay, let's go to the first example. Here's the theme, the power of prayer. How many main points? Three. Let's rate those points as to whether they are razor sharp, sharp, dull, or they don't even have anything to do with that theme. They're not even part of the knife. Okay, how would you rate number one? The theme is the power of prayer. The point is prayer's power is directly related to our consistency in its practice. Would you say that that point carries that theme in a razor-sharp way, sharp, dull, or you can't even see what it has to do with the theme. Let's go to the next one before we decide. We'll take the three, and then we'll come back. How about the next one? Prayer was the consistent practice of our Lord. What was the theme? The power of prayer. What's the point? Prayer was the consistent practice of our Lord. Is that point razor sharp about the theme or kind of dull about the theme? Or you can't even see how it has anything to do with the theme. Go to the third point. There are unspeakable blessings to seeing God answer prayer. How would you rate that? Is that point razor sharp about this theme? Here's the theme, the power of prayer. Here's the point unspeakable blessings to seeing God answer prayer. Is that razor sharp about that theme or dull about that theme or it doesn't have anything to do with the theme? Okay, let's go back and rate them. What would you say about number one? Prayer's power is directly related to our consistency in its practice. Let, let's try this. Let's get some votes. I, I can see your pictures here on my screen and you can hold up fingers. If you'd hold up fingers, we'll be able to see, okay? Can we all do that? All right, how many fingers would you hold up for number one? Would you hold up one finger, two fingers, three fingers, or four fingers? Let's, everybody, everybody try it. What are you gonna hold up? Dr. Arnold, you're not, no fair, you can't vote. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm, so far I'm getting two people voting. Jeff, uh, Jeff voted. Denny, can you vote? Have to hold your fingers up. Denny, can you hold your fingers up? How many fingers? You given two, three, okay. Lim, Lim Way, you want to vote? <laughs> okay, all right, good. Okay, well, let's start here with that analysis. None of you held up four fingers. None of you said that has nothing to do with the theme. Why? Why, why didn't you hold up four fingers? Well, 
because it is talking about prayer. The theme is about prayer, and the point has something about prayer. So you're saying, okay, I can see that that's, that's part of the knife. Okay. <clears throat> um, and what is that theme? What about prayer is the theme? Okay, it's not talking about consistency in prayer or uh, the time you pray or Jesus' prayers. It's talking about the what of prayer? The power of prayer, okay? Is the point talking about the power of prayer? Yes or no? Now, how about nod or heads yes or no? Is the point talking about the power of prayer? Okay, yeah, you can see that. Prayer's power, okay. So go back and look at your vote. Some of you held up two fingers. Did anybody hold up one finger? Some of you held up two fingers. Some of you held up three fingers. Okay. I'd, I'd like for you to think a little bit about why you held up two or three, because it looks to me like the point is talking about the theme. What's the theme? The power of prayer. What's the point? Prayer is power. So we'll come back to that, but you just think about, okay, why didn't I think that was sharp, razor sharp? Let's go to the next one. Prayer was the consistent practice of our Lord. How many fingers would you hold up on that one? Is that really sharp when it comes to carrying the theme, the power of prayer, or sharp, or dull, or doesn't even have to do with the theme? How many of you would hold up one finger? How many hold up two fingers? How many hold up three fingers? How many hold up, how many say, I don't think it has anything to do with that theme? How come a lot of you are not voting? <laughs> you have to vote. This can't be like an American election for the president where some of us <laughs> said, we don't have anybody good to vote for. Let's try it again. How many would hold up one finger? You, you got to vote, okay? How many would hold up one finger? Two fingers? Three fingers? Four fingers? Okay. All right. Why, why are you not holding up one finger? Why did nobody hold up one finger? All right, I think I know. Because the theme isn't just about prayer. If the theme was just prayer, <laughs> one word theme, prayer, okay, then you'd look at point two and say, oh, well, that, that's about prayer, so okay. The theme is about not just prayer, but what? The power of prayer. So you would expect that point two, in fact, you'd expect that every point would be about what? Not just prayer, but what? The power of prayer. And when you look at verse two, on uh, verse two, point two, you don't see you don't see what word in it. You don't see the word power. That's why you said, okay, the point is about prayer, but it's not about the sharp edge that I saw in the theme. Prayer's power. Go to point three. There are unspeakable blessings to seeing God answer prayer. Now, that point doesn't, doesn't have the word power, does it? So that's got the same problem in our minds that number two did, right? Okay. But, but, if I say to people, there's power in prayer, and they say, really? What kind of power? What happens? How can you say that? And I come back and say, there are unspeakable blessings to seeing God answer it. Does that in some way tell me about its power? Yes or no? Yeah, it does. Okay. In other words, even though number three doesn't have the word power, in my mind, logically, I can actually understand how that has something to do with the power of prayer. Whereas number two, I, I really can't see that has anything to do with the power. 
right? Everybody following this? Here's my point. My point is you don't, you don't necessarily have to have the whole theme stated in every point. But the points have to be about the theme. You have to be able to see some connection if the theme is going to be sharp. Let's go to example two. We'll just keep working with this a little bit. Here's my theme. The Christian life is an agony. Okay. Where is the really sharp point about the Christian life? It's a what? Agony. Now let's look at the points and see if they're logically subordinate to that. One, there are many trials in the Christian life. Well, I don't see the word agony there, but, but can I see how that might have something to do with why Christian life is an agony? Sure. So how would you rate that? Would you rate that a one, two, three, or four? How many would say, I'm going to put that in a one? Okay, how many would say a two? How many would say a three? Or a four? Okay. I, I, would prob- I personally would probably put it at a two, just because I think the very sharpest, the most razor sharp comes when you have the emphatic word in the theme repeated in your main points. But I think it's, nevertheless, I think it's a sharp point. All right, go to number two. It's an agony to resist sin. Well, where would you put that? How would you rate that? One, two, three, four. I, I would rate that a number one. Huh. Okay, somebody rated it number four. All right. I, I wish we had time to interact because I'd like to know, I'd like to be able to explore your thinking about that and see why you put it that way. But but think of the subordination this way, man. If if I say to the people, I'm going to preach to you today about the Christian life is an agony. Number one, it's an agony to resist sin. I think their minds follow that perfectly. There's the logical subordination there, okay? How about number three? Agony accompanies intercessory prayer. Well, I think that's a number one, and I actually like that better than number two. Why? I like the way it's stated better. Because the word agony is the first word of the point. Your mind really follows that. If somebody says, I'm going to preach to you today about the Christian life is an agony. Number one, agony accompanies intercessory prayer. Boy, the subordination of that's perfect. How about number four? The Christian life is an agony, number four, but there's still many blessings to being a Christian. <laughs> Well, what's, what's number four going to be about? It's not going to be about agony. It's going to be about what? Blessings. That's the exact opposite of the theme. <laughs> That's not even the same knife, okay? I'm not saying you can't do it. We do do that sometimes. But the point is that that edge then to the theme is not nearly as sharp because I got off on another <laughs> I got off on another kind of sword. All right. Everybody follow this. Okay. Now, let's analyze what's going on. Number 1. The most critical factor in razor sharp homiletics is that every point be a subset of the not just of the theme but of the theme's unique emphasis. That every main point be a subset of the theme's unique emphasis. What do I mean by that? Here we go. A, the unique emphasis of a theme is not the general subject area of the theme, like prayer or Christian life or evangelism or surrender. That's the general subject area. The unique emphasis is in the words with which you qualify the general subject area. Like this, examples. Here's the big theme, prayer. Here are the unique emphases, effectual prayer. I'm not just preaching today about effectual, 
prayer. I'm talking about effectual prayer. Or let's narrow it even further. I'm not just talking about effectual prayer. I'm talking about the results of effectual prayer. Or let's, let's narrow even further. Effectual prayer results in increased faith. If my sermon's going to have a sharp edge, every one of those points is going to be about what? Not just prayer, not just effectual prayer, not just results, but one particular result. Every point is going to be about what? Come on, tell me. Increased faith. Everybody follow that? That's how you end up with a sharp sermon theme. Now, got to pause here. and we're, Wow, we're about out of time. I can't believe it. Okay. Now, men, follow this. You can only do this if your text is doing it. You know, the big question is, is this text about prayer resulting in increased faith? If the text isn't about it, then Dabney that we looked at is saying, no, no, you can't do that. (laughs) Don't do that with that text. So the hermeneutics comes first. Correct interpretation comes first. But once you have that, now you're trying homiletically to give it this really sharp edge if the text actually does do that. Uh, We're about running out of time here. Joel, I've got 10.05. What do, you, what do you have here? About the same, maybe three minutes after. Yeah. If, uh, yeah. Can I run them through this one more example? Sure. Can everybody hang on for number two? Let's do this. The number two here. How can we show that every point develops that specific emphasis? Here are the ways. One sometimes by restating the entire theme in every main point. We looked at that. Look at the three main points. Effectual prayer results in the conversion of sinners. Effectual prayer results in the empowering of saints. Effectual prayer results in the glorification of God. What's the general theme? General theme is effectual prayer. What's the unique emphasis? The results. Everybody see that? Okay, go to the next one. So, so my point is, sometimes you just restate your entire theme in every point. Sometimes you restate only the unique emphasis in every main point. For instance, here's the theme, the Christian life is an agony. What's the unique emphasis? Agony. So all we've done here, we haven't repeated, we haven't said the Christian life is an agony in intercessory prayer. The Christian life is an agony when you win the loss. We've just taken the unique emphasis, agony, agony, agony. And sometimes the development is logically apparent and you didn't repeat either the theme or the unique emphasis. So you got it here, a Christian's relationships. Now, Look at those points. None of them have the theme of Christian's relationships. You could. You could say a Christian's relationships divide from the world. Christian's relationships divide, separate into God. Christian's relationships baptize in the body. You didn't do it. But the way those points are stated shows their logical subordination to that theme. And so you've got those three opportunities to do that. And what would be one of the advantage of advantages of not always doing it the same way? A little bit of variety, right? So that everything doesn't become predictable every time you, you preach. Okay, I'm going to give you what goes in the blank on the B, then we'll be done, because you can look through the rest of it. The word you want in the B there is the word grammatical. It really helps homiletically to state the points in grammatical parallelism to one another, if you can. All right. Well, listen, I've really enjoyed the time. Some of you are probably looking forward to getting into bed because you're on the other side of the world. Our day is just beginning here. It's the morning time. But sure wish you the very, very best in 
all of your service for the Lord. Thank you so much for your being so attentive and such a great, great class today. And to Dr. Arnold for all the hard work on this. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for your time here. Um, we're looking forward to our next lecture. So we'll just continue on, on Tuesday. But Pastor Menick, thank you again for mm -hmm. your willingness to, to come in and give two hours of your morning in a very, very busy, distinctively busy week for you. So, you so and much. if I can encourage all of us, we can uh, also pray for Pastor Menick and for his family during, today, during the rest of today and for these coming days, just as they're working through these events in their family's life. So, okay. Well, with that, we will be dismissed and uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you all back Tuesday. So thank you again. Have a great night. Thank you too. Bye-bye.